What's up, everybody? Welcome in to a long-awaited edition, if I do say so myself, Ethan, of SSPN Live. We've got a ton to dive into today, but you know, I was thinking about this episode, Ethan, just throughout the day and kind of when I was brainstorming for it and planning it a little bit. And this really is kind of the moment we've been waiting for. Like, obviously, the season's over and whatnot. But I think if if you asked us before the season, like, and this is kind of going to sound, I don't know, it's hard to describe. This is going to sound very simple. But like, we're here. After Victor Wembenyama's first season, we've seen what he's done through his rookie season. We We have the idea now, Ethan, the full true idea of where the Spurs are at with Victor Wembanyama on the roster. And it's the same place as last year. <laughs> Literally the exact same record. Obviously, it's a little different, but I had to throw that in there because we joked about it on our last live stream. What if they just win the next two games and we have the literally the same record as last year? And it's just funny when we look back at you know the hype that we had going into the preseason and everything that's gone down this year with Wemby moving from the four to the five, the Sohan experiment, the development of some other young guys. Um, with all of that being said, Ethan, it is nice to be here and have an outlook for the future with knowing how good Victor already is, but also knowing that there are still some team needs around him that the Spurs have to fill. Yeah, it feels like we're playing 2K My League and we drafted <laughs> Wemby at number one and now we just simulated the entire season knowing it was going to be a, I guess we didn't know exactly how bad of a season it would be, but here we are 22 and 60, same record, like you said, it's last season. And it feels like now's kind of where it starts, right? We're, we we finally have an opportunity to build around Wemby, knowing what his skill sets are going to be uh, going into his second year, knowing what his strengths, his weaknesses are. Um, and I think with the comfortability that he lasted the entire year, really without injury, um, and kind of shouldering off the whole, oh, he's too skinny to play in the NBA, other than the two games against uh, Embiid. And who was the other guy that went crazy? Was it Cat that went crazy on him? Maybe not. I'm thinking there, the Embiid game. I think the Embiid was definitely by far the worst one. But then Jokic those, gave him some numbers, you could say, but he got Jokic a couple times too. Right. That's why I didn't even mention it. But other than those couple of games, uh, I think he beat the accusations of being too skinny to play in the NBA. So you're right. Now's the excitement. Now's where everything is fun again. We don't have to lose all the games every week. Now it's talking about who's the guy we bring in in the draft, who's the guy we bring in in free agency, trade rumors, et cetera, et cetera. And then watching the guys develop on their socials. Um, and in the media. Yeah, absolutely. Couldn't have said it better myself, Ethan. But before we get completely into the offseason, we are going to recap the two wins that the Spurs had to end the offseason. Ethan, you and I did not get to watch the Nuggets game, but that I think has at least cracked the mm. top five, like top five games this season. You could even tell from the highlights, Victor Wembanyama scored 17 points in three minutes when the Spurs were down 20. Mm -hmm. On top of that, Sandro Mamukelishvili had like 21 and 11. I was trying to pull up the stats, but I kept getting the music in my ear, so I didn't do it. But we're going to get that box score up here in a second. But on top of that, a blowout win against the Detroit Pistons at home without Victor, with basically the Austin Spurs playing. David Duke with 15 points, six for eight, two for three from three. Um, I could go on and on, but I'm just, we'll start with that Nuggets game, Ethan, just to fully mm. recap the season here. What were your thoughts on that one? And then also give me your thoughts on the Detroit games. I get the box score up. It's the fact that we lost the second quarter, Jude, 37 to 18. And then bounced back, like you said, 37 to 32, and then 34 to 20 in the fourth quarter in favor of San Antonio without Devin Vassell, Jeremy Sohan, Keldon Johnson, just to name the big three. Obviously, we had Wembenyama. You mentioned the, the 17 points in three minutes. He also got a technical. The crowd was amped. It was a team effort. And I think it's a confidence booster for a lot of these players, like Mamu Kelashvili, who had 21 and 12, a double double for him. Trey Jones with 14 and 10 and 6. Always kind of flirts with that triple double, especially as of late. Uh, I think that's kind of funny to see. And then Julian with 14, Zach Collins off the bench with 15. 
And then, of course, Devontae Graham with the game winner and 11 points. I think both of his threes were also very timely, if yes. I remember correctly, from the highlight reel. So, And then C.D. Sissoko, how could I forget? Four for five, eight points. He just continues to be one of the most athletic guys I've ever seen. Just get, like If he's at the rim, it's a dunk. It's not going to be a layup. It's a dunk. Um, so for them to come back and win that game in the fashion that they did without some of our best players, um, again, it's, an, it's a testament to not only Wemby's star player, power, but Pop's development uh, prowess as a coach and the fact that he can pull out uh, confidence and, and give role players the ability or what's, what's the word I'm looking for? The thought confidence. that they have more within them than maybe they actually do. Does that make sense? Like he, he brings forward the best out of everybody. And I think this was a perfect example of that. This game also prevented the season sweep against the Nuggets. So I'm right. sure the guys were really happy about that. You mentioned CD Sissoko. You can look at the four foul or the five fouls. We, we, we've kind of seen that. Even I remember our prospect profiles last year, watching his tape in the G League mm-hmm. with at night. That was something that, you know, was a little bit of an issue. And he did have a four foul game in the Pistons game. But the others before that, he didn't really have that many. But regardless, here's the main thing. He didn't foul out. So, you know, he used as many as he could. You can look at it that way. Dennis Rodman style. Um, <laughs> no, right. plus 14 in all seriousness. That's the second highest plus minus on the team, despite just being, you know, just having eight points and, and three boards. We, we've talked about it in our last live stream. And I just posted a clip today uh, of that conversation. I posted three clips today. So go check all those out on the channel. Um but man, there's a lot of things that don't show up on the stat sheet that CD Sissoko adds, and that's why his plus minus was so high. And yeah, not to mention that his defensive ability, which is kind of underrated, something you don't see on the box score. Actually, he did have two blocks at three steals in the Detroit game, so I guess you do see it on the box score from time to time. Yeah. Uh, but to me, his biggest plus is that he's not a minus, right? Like he's not getting in anyone's way. He's making the right cuts. He's in the right place at the right time. Uh, and he's not making silly mistakes. Like you talked about the foul trouble. We knew that was going to be a problem for him because he's kind of an aggressive defender. Um, but that's something I'm willing to live with, especially right now at the end of the season when really nothing matters. Yeah, absolutely. And and just to touch on this game a little bit before we get into the Detroit box score here in a second, because you mentioned those. CD had a highlight, mm. highlight block that's where he right. just swatted somebody against the rim. I think... The Pistons ended up getting the offensive rebound and scoring anyway, but still, it was like he just came out of nowhere, like midair, and just swatted it. And I was just, I mean, it was it was one of those plays, despite it being against the, <laughs> that version of the Pistons, where it looks right. like half of them didn't even want to play out there on Sunday. It was a rough day for them. Um, it was still one of those plays that that makes your eyebrows raise, it makes your jaw drop, and it's like, wow, like, this dude has a ton of athleticism, and if it can be honed with with the flashes of skills that we've seen, not to repeat myself, Ethan, but it's why the Spurs gave him a fully guaranteed deal, and, and I'm really excited to see what he looks like um, just even in two years, let alone next season. And he dropped an absolute dime in the highlights for this game that didn't count because I, whoever he passed it to missed the layup. I can't remember who it was, but it was like a Boris Diaw, Magic Johnson level no look bounce pass in full court. Like he's got the intangibles. Yeah. It, it's so it it jumps off the screen, like you said. Yeah, and I, I jumped around a little bit there, but Mamu, that's another name that we've mm-hmm. got to talk about late in the right. season. It's not just this game. He's had other games where, you know, I mentioned the Ofer game on a couple streams ago, but even in that game, he had 11 boards, found a way to contribute, you know, in some form or fashion, even when his shot isn't falling. He, his shot was falling, though, in this game. Uh, it fell in the Detroit game. We might as well mm-hmm. lead into that because of this conversation. Right. Um, and I believe he was the leading scorer in that game. But regardless, he has shown a lot of intangible things. Um, and and, th- and he is the leading scorer. Um, and he's also just shown a lot of skills as well. Um, seven for 13, three for six overall, eight boards once again, 18 points. Just in this last stretch of the season here, Ethan, he's just done so many good things. And mm-hmm. they're... You know, when we talk about CD, I was thinking about this earlier today too. When thinking about Mamu, it it the FIBA in them, if you will, it just it, it just oozes on the tape. Do you get what I'm saying? For sure, that like they have a lot of similarities play style wise. The difference is Mamu's more finesse, 
Whereas I think Sissoko is more physicality and raw athleticism. But I think why Sissoko has a higher upside is he could eventually get there. Like how old is Mamu? 24, 25? Something like that. Maybe he's younger than that. But he's an older young player is what I'm getting. Just what I'm trying to say. Whereas Sissoko is 19 years old and has already shown flashes of having the same ability as Mamu. But you're right. They have the same, you know, they make the right cut. They're in the right place at the right time. Make the right pass. Um, they don't take contested shots. They move the ball, and, and they take advantageous uh, baskets at the right time. And they also get crazy rebounds and play pretty solid defense. Um, so if if Sissoko can somehow take some of that the skills that Mamu has <laughs> kind of learned uh, and blend it with his raw athleticism and talent, uh, the sky's really the limit for that guy. Yeah, and you know, another thing, just talking about CD and Mamu, even with, I could, you know, we could say all this stuff and, and you just put it perfectly and, and I did my best to describe it as well whenever it comes to the things that you see from Mamu and CD, but going back to Mamu specifically, on that Detroit game, last broadcast of the year, Sean Elliott goes, Mamu's got to come back, right? We got to have a roster spot for Mamu. And, and when Sean Elliott's saying that, I know he's not, the be all end all Ethan but at the same time I think that's I think that's telling and with the way that he's played down the stretch I would be surprised that he's at least not our third string four next year I mean he has an argument for backup four I agree with that if we don't bring back Chetty Osman which I, I don't think that we will I think he'll kind of make that decision for himself honestly like if if push comes to shove he'd rather win a championship probably at this stage of his career no problem with that love what he did for us this season but is he playing over Sissoko next year I I I know there's probably a huge number of fans that want Sissoko to play because of his upside right but if we're if we're being honest with how pop and the Spurs organization run if it's between Mamu and CD it's probably going to be Mamu at least for the start of the year um and give him an opportunity to, to play himself out of those minutes because he's absolutely earned the right to have rotational minutes with this team. It's shocking with how well he's played this last couple weeks that he was not a rotational piece for us this season. Yeah. And, 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 you know, it's, first of all, I totally get what you're saying with the flashes that he's shown uh, over the past couple weeks. But the thing about CD too, and, and this just gets in, I don't want to jump ahead here because we're going to talk about a lot of stuff today. We've got a lot on the rundown. Um, but CD's very versatile. Like mm-hmm. CD's a guy who can play two through four. Right. You know what I mean? So I'm thinking about if, say, this is complete converse, you know, complete just total speculation conversation right now. A lot has to play out before this question even is asked within the Spurs. Mm-hmm. But say CD's beating out Malachi in in effort reps. Just for conversation, right? Okay. You could you could play him over Malachi, and and, and you can play Keldon or CD at the two. You know, whatever you want to do, mm. and you could have you know, and that depends on what is going to happen with the backups as well. I assume it's Blake Wesley as of right now, but the, with how good Wemby is, there's a lot more possibilities for the Spurs this year. And even Pop had a quote about that, which we're going to get into here in a little bit. But just for the sake of this conversation, getting back to this, I mean, you could maybe even see that potentially as well, where Mamu and CD play off the bench. No, for sure, because I'm I'm forgetting that this year we played eleven man rotation a lot of the year, where Blake was the guy that was the eleventh man, especially before Malachi got sat and was in the doghouse for that that stretch, whatever that period was. Right, like he would come in for like depending on the game, seven to fifteen minutes maybe. Like varying, maybe, maybe that's CD's role. You know, someone's not playing well. Like he's a Keldon's having an off shooting night. Malachi's not giving enough defensive effort. Mamu's not getting any rebounds. Insert CD Sissoko. Let him learn on the job in that situation. I could see that for sure. Yeah, and, and the other thing that we've talked also about is you never know what's going to happen with Champagne either. If they really believe in CD, maybe CD right. starts cutting into some of those minutes. And, and I see our man Brandon Vela here, and he says that here. I don't want to have it. Don't want to make you the little guy there, Ethan. That's, I'm used um, to it. <laughs> Brandon Vela says, I don't see CD playing guard at all, LOL. He's a forward, in my opinion. I totally get what you're saying. That's where I'd rather put him also. But he does have a lot of ball handling ability that he's shown on tape. We talked about that last um, 
last podcast that we did, we saw it. He, he was a primary ball handler for Ignite, not just for the Austin Spurs that we saw this season. But I still do agree with you overall. He's a 3-4, but I think he's a very skilled and versatile player. And because of that FIBA background, um, I, don't, I, I think you can play him there. I know that the shooting ability might not be where you want it to be, but this is all just... <laughs> speculative talk as well and the other thing i mentioned in that comment is you could maybe even move Keldon to the two in that situation as well and at this point i think our team is transitioning to completely positionless almost without set style of basketball and cd sissoko to me is a classic point forward and quite right. honestly i think he might be a better point forward in the traditional sense than even jeremy sohan is at For sure. point in their careers. Uh, I think we tried to shoehorn Jeremy at point guard. Even I was a fan of it. I Me know too. the experiment didn't work. Uh, but I think CD actually might be naturally better at a position like that than even Jeremy was. Yeah, we've definitely seen more flashes, and it feels like the ball handling comes, comes more natural to him. Um, but we will have to see, Ethan. It'll all play out. But to get back to this Detroit game a little bit, just with some little takeaways from the end of the season... Raekwon Gray, a really solid game from him. Nothing crazy, plus 15 in the box score. Go ahead, Ethan. Uh, all I'm going to say about Raekwon Gray, watching him play with that armband on and his style, you know who he reminds me of a lot? <laughs> I thought for a second I'm in my head, I'm like, is he going to say Kobe because of no, the armband? No, 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 no. But not, I know, not I know Kobe. it's not that. <laughs> you ready? Yes. And it makes sense with how Wemby's compared to Giannis. Bobby Portis. Okay. Let that settle. A young I can see. DT. I can see that now, he's going to be more of a four because he's mm-hmm. six seven in comparison to Bobby being six ten six eleven. But I I see the play style. He can pass. He can stretch the floor. I know he's zero for two in this game. But go watch his G League highlights, and I believe there are some other games he played this year where he hit some threes. Mm-hmm. Um, but can move on the floor and and very physical. Um, I see. I see what, where you're going for there, Ethan. I see the similarities for sure. I appreciate it. He had like a fadeaway, like free throw line, smooth shot. And I was like, hmm, hmm, he's a real physical guy. Like I can see Bobby Portis, but I don't know if he'll be, if he'll be a long-term project, but I liked what right. I saw. I, I get I get the comparison you're going for there, Ethan. Maybe he never reaches the Bobby Portis heights, but mm. there are shades of Bobby Portis in his game for sure. <laughs> Devontae Graham, another, another solid performance here. David Duke, probably the biggest eye popper off the screen and of course cd even though it wasn't the best shooting night for him look at him just filling up the stat sheet overall five assists for him in this detroit game as well that's kind of what we were just alluding to when we talk about his passing skills um but the the person that i want to talk about before we end this off ethan is blake wesley because this is probably his best game game of the year and there were two straight possessions you see the steals i believe there were two in a row where he got steals where he just completely read Jaden Ivey, or, or I don't know if it was he was guarding Jaden Ivey off ball. Regardless, some combination of Marcus Sasser and and Jaden Ivey, he picked them off twice and was just reading them like knew where where they were going to pass before they even passed it, and it mm-hmm. just led to some. Uh, I don't know if he scored on both of those. He might have racked up an assist, but still plus twenty four, highest on the team in this game, seven for nine overall. One for one from three, two for three from the free throw line, 17 points, seven boards, five assists, and three steals, uh, and just one turnover from Blake. This this is one of his best games of the season. And I, I lots of flashes here. Obviously, the level of competition matters, but mm-hmm. the fact that he's doing this and making it look easy to an extent against this level of competition shows the way that he's grown this season. And not even playing point guard, really playing kind of the two spot next to Trey Jones, which a lot of people think is his more natural position. Um, I like him at at backup point personally, but it it shows his versatility as a guard. He can be a combo guard. He can score like he he did tonight. He can also pass. He's got that skill set as well. I I love this kid, man. I say kid. He's literally like two years younger than me, but um, (laughs) I, I love his demeanor. I love how he answers questions. I loved his, his end of year media conference. Uh, he's very open and honest with himself and his game. He, he, what's crazy about Blake Wesley is he's like the polar opposite of most guards coming into the NBA. Like most point guards are coming in with the ability to shoot and finish. Those are probably his biggest weaknesses is three point shooting and finishing with layups. He can dunk, but like he's right. got the athleticism, but it's his, it's his prowess defensively. It's his, his, his desire to defend. 
that separates him and its desire to get better because his biggest deficiency last year was by far and away um, turning over the ball, making stupid passes. I think we can say with certainty that he fixed that this season, Jude. So if he can fix one more flaw next year, whether that be shooting or finishing with consistency, I'd rather it be shooting because we know he can dunk. And shooting with Wemby is obviously of utmost importance. So if he can come in next year just shooting low 30s to mid 30% from three, that's all I want from Blake Wesley. He's got the intangibles, he has the personality, and he has the defense. I think he, a lot of people hate on him for no reason. I've been very happy with his season. Yeah, I, I think this game, ending it this way, I think is a testament, like I said earlier, to his growth. Not to repeat myself too much, but no, please, I, please. I've been very solid. or, or I feel You've very solid. solid. <laughs> Thank you. No, but I feel very solid about his future, future going forward and the growth and development I saw from him this season. Because at the end of the day, that's what we realized pretty quickly after our preseason predictions weren't going to happen. It took us like, what, a month? I remember we came out, we were like, we're going to wait until Christmas. And we ended up coming out before Christmas because it became so obvious that this season was going to be more about development and, and you know, learning how to play next to Victor. Devin Vassell talked about that today in his end of uh, year media availability. Mm-hmm. We're going to get into that here in a second. Um, but yeah, solid game from Blake. And more importantly, um, as much as we would have liked to lose this game for lottery odds, <laughs> the fact that this game just wasn't even close. Right. Like, like I, the, the first quarter was a little close. But after that, by midway through the second quarter, it, we just put our foot on their throat. And I know that you could say maybe this is the easiest NBA team that, that mm-hmm. played all year, opponent-wise, I mean, when it comes to the, this Detroit roster on the last game of the season and the way that their year has gone. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, for these guys, for us, this was a good statement, or not necessarily statement, but them beating the Pistons in this way was good to see from the guys that we played in this game. I'm not even going to add anything, Jude. You just summarized <laughs> it perfectly. There we go, Ethan. Well, let's go ahead and look at what's next on the docket. That's end of season media availability. Mm. Now, I'm not sure if you got to catch any of these, Ethan, but I watched all of them today. Uh, I saw that they dropped Devin Vassell, Keldon Johnson, Jeremy Sohan, and Victor Wembenyama. Um, Do you just want me to go through my takeaways? Please, go ahead. You go first. So I'm just going off my head on these, but um, the Keldon, or, or excuse me, I'll start with Jeremy. The main takeaway for him was just shooting is the focus this offseason. Um, that's really all it is when it comes to rotation, form, et cetera, et cetera. On the court, that's what he's looking for. The other interesting thing, he showed us or gave us some details on his surgery. So he just had surgery, a procedure that was done. I forget what it was. I could look at the Spurs injury report of the, the tweet. Just go to Tom Orsborn or Jeff McDonald or Noah Magaro George on Twitter. And you'll see the exact it was it was a lower, it was a lower body injury. I forget if it was his ankle or his calf or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but to get the full details, regardless, he wants to be ready to play for the Olympics this summer, which is something I completely forgot about just when it comes to us, like mm-hmm. Victor and Jeremy potentially playing in the Olympics this summer in Paris. That's going to be some content for us in the offseason, so that made me happy. Um, but getting back to Jeremy, he got this procedure done because of the fact that he wanted to play for the Olympics. So he got it done earlier than he would have otherwise. What that tells me, they knew when he was playing that he had something that he wanted to get a procedure on eventually. But you know, it was so minor that he was just playing through it. Once again, that ties into what we talk about, Ethan, where it's like all of a sudden they're not playing and now they're out for the season after a third game, three game win streak. Uh, Yes, the timing with the Olympics had to do with that, like I just mentioned, but also it's showing that if there was no Olympics, he might finish out the season. Maybe you hold him out the last couple games just because we did that last year, too. Um, Mm. But that was kind of my main takeaway from hearing that is that just kind of only confirmed our suspicions on uh, the, the procedures that, that he had. It was similar to um, Devin's knee procedure last year, you know, except like not as serious basically. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I loved his body language and how he felt about everything that had transpired this year. The shooting thing was obviously a big component to what he's going to work on this summer as well as the Olympics. But Something that 
I I was excited about was uh or not excited about but pleased with was the openness in which he spoke about the point Sohan experiment and mm. he was like yeah it didn't work like I think he blatantly said like you know it, it didn't have the effect that we were hoping it was going to but someone asked him do you think you actually learned some skill sets you know from that and he was said absolutely he said he there were some things that he learned from that experience that he can then translate into playing power forward or small forward whatever position he's at um that have grown his game and um you know impact how he thinks when he's on the court so for those of you that said it was a terrible idea sure we did it did not translate to winning but i think that it will translate long term to jeremy sohan's overall game yeah, and I think we we saw that this season with the dump offs. Um, I think, and we we've talked about this at nauseum too. Just in the modern NBA, there is more playmaking opportunities for the four. Now, it's mm-hmm. not going to be anything crazy, um, but at the same time, I mean, we've seen it with Boris at the four before. Um, I know we we compare CD a lot to Boris, um, just with their French connections and and their play style. But uh, there's some shades of Boris in there from Jeremy. I, I saw the point that I'm getting to is I saw some things from him at the four playmaking wise, him taking it up the floor, the dump offs, passing in transition, even sometimes running some sets with Trey Jones on the floor from time right. to time, just where the complete load isn't on him and he's not being ball pressured 100 percent of the time. The point is with what you were saying there is you think you saw some skills, you know, that he built upon from that experience, despite it obviously not working. Um, yeah, I think the things that I just mentioned were, were a couple of things that we saw and that were improved after that experience. A thousand percent. I like what the guy says here in the comments. Sohan is a future all star. No one believed in Brunson either. Mm. Jeremy Sohan, I don't even know if he's 21 yet, man. I get what you're saying, the guy. Tons of potential for Jeremy, for sure. You know what's funny? Like he, he talked a lot about the shooting thing. He actually got a lot better this year at shooting. Right. So like it's it's funny that like that's still his main focus. It, it shows that it's something that he and the Spurs want to definitely emphasize is continuing to work on that and not settling with just like, okay, I'm average now. I can shoot it and it be this for the rest of my career. And I think they know that that's important for playing around Victor as well, because there's a lot of times where they left Jeremy open and Jeremy's like, yeah, I got better, but it it wasn't to the standard where we want to be moving forward playing next to Victor. And so him having that self-awareness is another good thing, too. Agreed. But moving on to Devin Vassell, I'm honestly kind of blanking a little bit. (laughs) On on Devin and Keldon's, I watched both. I remember Keldon. Keldon said that it wasn't his fault that that Ju, that he bit Julian. It was actually Julian's fault that he turned into him, and he should have known that Keldon would be that excited. And I tend to agree personally. Right, uh, it, <laughs> Julian. What what were you thinking, dude? Just <laughs> you took his starting position, and then you just threw your head into his mouth. Like what, what what's going on? Pause. Okay. <laughs> in all seri- Kelton said that too. Uh, in all seriousness, um, just remembering a little bit, that vibed me some time to remember a little bit of what Kelton said. Honestly, he just talked a lot about the team mm-hmm. and, and how he just wants to continue to be the energy guy. He felt like he's, he's tried to do that all season. There's some things that, you know, there were ups and downs this season, mm-hmm. but he thinks overall his role on the team as a teammate, like that's kind of what he tries to focus in on. And we've seen that with him being willing to to accept, you know, going from a starter after being a starter since the Durante, De, 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 the Dejounte DeRozan era. I said Durante, Dejounte DeRozan era. Since he was a starter at the four in the bubble, you know, he was willing to go to the bench. Um, I don't, you know, I don't re- really remember a lot of him going super in depth on like, okay, what are some things I can improve on moving forward, or what are some mm-hmm. things that you know, I think I could get better at probably because everybody just started choking about the Julian comment he made Right, because it was only like eight minutes. So I think that took up some of it. Um, But, but like I said, the main thing he really talked about was just continuing to be regardless of whatever, like, I remember this one quote, he's like, I just want to do whatever's best for my teammates. I want to do whatever, you know, whatever position the, the front office and the coaching staff puts me in, I just want to thrive in it. Basically, he was just saying, I'm realizing this as I'm talking, he doesn't care what his role is moving forward. Like, I mean, obviously he cares to some extent, but the example of him getting 
not benched, but moved to the six man role this season. He just kind of reiterated that he's willing to do whatever, you know, mm-hmm. is asked of him in the off season, during the season, whatever it may be. And and it also shows that he just has the ultimate trust in the Spurs. But I mean, this is why we made the clip today of Keldon Johnson getting too much hate. You can criticize him on the floor as much as you want, but this dude is willing to do whatever, and he's not going to sit there and be like, "Oh, I'm the best." Blah 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 blah. Mm-hmm. He's gonna he's gonna take all of the criticism, try to work on it, and be put in whatever position he can to be on the Spurs and and help them in this next era. That's really as I'm thinking about it, and maybe maybe I'm off a little bit. I don't think I am, but that mm-hmm. was kind of my t- takeaway. Um, just looking back on that press conference. Yeah, dude, I loved his honesty. Um, they asked him about that very thing. And the, the question guy, the interviewer, question guy, the interviewer <laughs> phrased the question by saying, like, you were moved to the bench, but, you know, your minutes stayed the same, your points pretty much stayed the same, like, your impact was the same, and you closed the game. So it probably wasn't even that big of a transition. And he, he, was, he was honest, and he was like, no, I mean, I'm not going to lie. It was tough. Like it, it was a hard thing to swallow to get moved to the bench. However, that's when he followed it up with everything that you just said about it's important to do what's best for the team, the coaching staff, his teammates, however, it, whatever he can do to make the best impact. And he accepted it. And I think he really thrived um, off the bench in that role. We've talked about it at length. We don't have to go into detail right now. Um, but he also discussed how he felt like he got better as a playmaker because of that. And that's something that he took the biggest step in this season. I don't think they got into detail about what he's going to work on in the offseason, Jude. Like you said, I do know he'll be in China and Japan in a couple right. weeks. Can't remember why that came up, but that detail just hit me in between the eyes. Um, well, yes, the shoe started, deal with the China right. company. Yeah, that's right. But to me, the biggest takeaway for Keldon is how much he's grown and matured just not even as a player, but like as a, as a man, it sounds weird saying too, cause he's also like our age, but right. he's approaching everything with a lot more wisdom and a lot less just silly, goofy time. I'm sure he's still that guy behind the scenes, but when he's in front of the media and when he's talking to his teammates, he's absolutely one of the leaders of this team. Yeah, for sure. They talked about the pregame huddle that he kind of created, you know, obviously Victor gets involved, but that's telling. Like, say whatever you want about Kelton, but he's leading the huddle. Not mm-hmm. everybody does that, you know. Right. And that goes back to to Rob Trejo Jr.'s point on his recent podcast, just talking about how he embodies all the intangible, you know, um, off the court, but also things that translate to on the court. Um, Spurs can, uh, characteristics, culture, yeah. qualities, and characteristics. Yeah. Mm. The double cu, the alliteration there, Jude. I like that. <laughs> okay, getting to Devin though, um, man, do you okay? Did you watch Devin's or no? Uh yes, I did. Okay, I'm blanking a little bit on some of the details there because I watched all four of these today, um, mm-hmm. and I just watched Wemby's like 17 minute one before this. So maybe right. if if you start this one off, my my I might have some memories start going. Absolutely. No problem. Uh, I remember one of the things that he said was how happy he was to actually play a majority of this year and feel like he grew with the team Mm -hmm. and had an impact as a teammate and something that he felt like they, they improved on during the year and that he's most looking forward to getting better at this off season is his chemistry with Vic. Um, He said he wants to work with Vic during the off season, work on their two two man game. game and just get more comfortable playing next to each other. And to me, that speaks volumes about what we've talked about for, it feels like, almost two years now, which is that he will be the Robin to his Batman because of his ability to be a three-level scorer, take guys off the dribble, manipulate the pick and roll, play make, or take a shot for himself. Like, Wemby's by far and away the first option. I think Devin would tell you that. Like He's very open and honest about that. Um but he's another guy like Keldon that, that it just feels a lot more mature, feels a lot more comfortable and at ease when talking about how important it is that Wembenyama, you know, is is extremely involved in the team and that it's his job to make his life easier and to work on their compatibility. To me, that was the biggest takeaway from him. 
Yeah, I mean, you you just reminded me there when when he specifically said, "Yeah, we're gonna do some things in the gym. We're definitely gonna work on our two man game." I'm like, okay, well, you saw that improve throughout the season. That was probably one of the biggest bright part bright mm-hmm. spots offensively for the team all year. So if they're gonna continue to work on that that mm-hmm. leveling up, I can only imagine what that will do for our offense. Um, but yeah, man, I'm like you you kind of said it all there that the maturity that we've seen. Um, and, and also just the adjustment as well. He, he mm-hmm. said it again, and it's something we've kind of questioned or not questioned, but we were talking about it during the rising stars challenge. We've talked about it since the Spurs had the start that they did, but he reiterated again. He's like, it's really hard to play with the dude who's seven foot four and moves like him. And it, it mm-hmm. takes an adjustment. Um, so to see that reiterated and hear it, you know, from the horse's mouth, if you will, mm-hmm. um, that's just another thing that. You know, that's why we're we're happy to be where we're at today, Ethan, because we can know, okay, for sure, the context. Mm-hmm. Because of Victor's uniqueness, like joining a brand new team, it's going to be tough for guys to adjust and learn to play around him. And we didn't know that necessarily. We didn't anticipate it being as difficult as it has coming mm-hmm. into this season. Obviously, there were so many good things that Victor did. I mean, you guys have probably seen the tweets floating around of him basically beating LeBron in almost every statistical category. Not not every single one. I said almost, keyword, almost, yeah. uh, from their uh, respective rookie seasons, you know. Um, mm-hmm. But but that was, that was, on top of the stuff that you just said, Devin reiterating that fact is, is I think, something that's so important when we look at this season. A thousand percent. There is a, and you touched on this at the beginning, there is now a clear cut path for everybody. Whereas there wasn't really one last year at the end of the year, because we didn't know who we were going to draft. We didn't know who we were going to sign. Like we just knew we were terrible. Right. Mm-hmm. Now we know what everyone's job is. And I think that there's like, we continue to say a comfortability and a maturity in everybody's post game conferences because of that, or end of season conferences because of that facts okay ethan i got a request real quick okay can you hold down the comments for like a minute or so while i run to the restroom and then we'll come back and do victor's uh victor's post game absolutely i can if you have a comment hurry up and get it in here we only have two minutes (laughs) all right i'll catch y'all all right all right while jude is using the restroom i will take a look at what we have in the comments section let's start with muhammad says CD looks a little slow for my taste. He racks up fouls faster than points. He does rack up fouls. This has probably been the biggest knock on him literally since pre-draft. Um, I remember Jude and I talking about him when we drafted him and when we saw him in the in the summer league. We were like, yeah, he, he fouls he fouls out. Like He has difficulty getting his hand out of the cookie jar. Um, I think that's something that just comes with the territory of being a young player and being an aggressive player. Something that will likely get fixed over time as he gets more and more play time with the actual San Antonio Spurs. Um, the slow thing, I'm not sure I see the slow thing. I think he's pretty darn fast for a guy his size. Now, in comparison to Trey Jones and Blake Wesley, for sure. But for a 6'7", six, 6'8", six, I don't know how much he weighs, but just a stout bulldog of a man, I think he moves pretty quick and has a pretty tight handle. Um, but that's just my opinion. And look at that record time. That's like 45 seconds. Wow. I only answered one comment. Oh, I only missed one? Only one. Still wash my hands, though. Don't y'all be thinking. Let me you smell. Know. You can't my, do that. That's what my grandma <laughs> used to do to me when I was a little boy. <laughs> That's funny. That's Let good. Smell. I'm like, no. Uh, um, but okay. Anyway, dude. No, going back to Victor Wembenyama's press there conference. There we go. Um, Noah Magaro George already tweeted about this, but it's still the thing that stands out to me the most. There were a lot of different things. This is something that in every single long form interview, and even in the smaller press conferences that Wemby does, his introspection and the way that he really thinks about his answers always stands out to me. And I think that's a testament to just, I mean, not all like that's, that's a testament to obviously he's special physically in a multitude of ways. He's an alien physically, but mentally, I think that's what really has made him who he is. We, we, we joke that he's kind of like a philosopher going into the season. Um, but he really does think about his answers. It's not just a quick, Oh, let me just say this, blah, 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 blah. So that's something that stood out to me. But the other thing I was getting to 
in that he says, my, my trust in the coaches and the front office never wavered a second. Mm-hmm. Um, he got into some other details regarding that. I think people just asked follow-up questions like, what did the Spurs do that made you, you know, not lose faith in them, essentially? But he just, I mean, he just batted all that away. He was like, that's not even like anywhere in my demeanor. Like, yes, I didn't want to lose 60 games, but this is what it was. As the season went on, he basically said he started to see, you know, the the light at the end of the tunnel, if you will, with, with other players on the rosters. He even said, he's like, I don't necessarily have any examples. I think that was because he couldn't like give out intel probably or he didn't want to be like i saw this guy start to really become better (laughs) you know what i mean like he's not going to do that publicly um but i mean he talked about his teammates he he had 100 percent trust in them and how despite the season going how it did it just seemed like he really saw you know what we're trying to build here for the future he said that himself Mm. right um i don't think before anyone comments this i don't think what Victor said about his relationship with the organization has at any level, I don't think it has anything like, uh, Oh, he's just saying this in front of the media to save face. You know, I, it felt very genuine. And a lot of that comes from what you said. He thinks a lot about his answers. He's a philosopher. If it was disingenuous, he would have those answers ready to go. He would have the script memorized. They ask him, what's your opinion on San Antonio? Oh, I love it. It's great. They're doing a great job. But he goes into detail, he thinks about it, which makes me think he's a very authentic human being, um, w- which puts me at ease because I know there's a lot of rumors about if the Spurs don't make a move, you know, is he going to be upset? I don't, I don't, I'm not so sure that's the thing anymore, to be completely honest with you. Um, and the other biggest takeaway, just to kind of emphasize what you said, he said it was a two-sided relationship between him and the front office. And it's not 100% him, it's not 100% them. There's a give and take there. Like, they didn't want him to play this last game. He said he wanted to, but he understands that it's not his decision. He's a player. He stays in his lane, they stay in his lane, and he's pleased that they invite him, you know, to give his opinion on whatever moves they might be considering. And that, that makes it feel great, I'm sure. But I think he knows that he's the player, not the coach, not the front office. And this might have something to do with the fact that it is Greg Popovich, it is the San Antonio Spurs, right. and there's a certain level of trust and respect there. Um, but th- that really put me as just a fan, not even as a commentator, quote unquote, as a fan that put me at a, a, a much higher level of ease. Yeah, and and just side note, Jesse mm-hmm. Luna just sent in the super sticker for a dollar with 200 emojis. So we appreciate you very much my guy any Thanks, anything that y'all do that that supports the channel like that we we always greatly appreciate it but the other thing going back to victor's press conference he he also said verbatim i never thought that i wasn't in the best situation possible right. or the best place possible so he said that twice like best situation best place and you know a lot of spurs fans even ourselves would we really look at it and be like was this the best possible situation for him this year we would probably tell ourselves no but the fact he's saying that that that's a testament to all the spurs things behind the scenes i know we're spurs fans i know we're biased but victor's not saying that for nothing i don't think so either extremely authentic demeanor one thousand percent okay last funny thing on victor's victor's press conference and then we'll move on to some other stuff um just him talking about texas and Mm -hmm. at the end he goes he goes oh when we got here we're like oh it's not like the movies (laughs) he's like i thought it was like a desert with the cowboys and everything and then he looks at the french reporters he's like i'm not wrong right and they're like no you're not he's like i realized very quickly it wasn't no victor you just moved to a giant metropolis actually that has indefinite road construction and um uh lots of people and lots of things (laughs) and a thousand percent it's funny he's not the only i've met several people like just out of state like in America, they're like, do you guys have cowboys walking around? Like, do you ride horses to school? I'm like, no, <laughs> it's not at all what Texas is. Like maybe like one or two towns, but no, it's it's an actual state with cities and buildings. Oh, that's funny. 
Spencer Galloway is in here. He says, compared to the other teams at the top of last year's draft, SA is probably the best. That's that's definitely fair. And I also, I, pu- I pulled this up earlier, but this dude's in our old stomping grounds, Ethan. He says, shout out from SMTX, go Spurs go. So shout out to you, the Houston Oiler. Me and Ethan, we, we spend our time in San Marcos. I even do too, still from time to time. I drive through it on my way home. There you go. You know that. what? Next time, let's let's do a meet and greet. <laughs> just just <laughs> you, me, and the Houston Oiler. We'll <laughs> just, lunch. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of that, man, Victor Victor's driven through San Marcos. Can you believe that? I can actually. Yeah. It's pretty. That's All the pretty way to Austin. To think about. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> For the I thirty five series, baby. <laughs> Marcos, it's on the way to Austin. That's I know my I boy Barlo. You what? Sorry, I, I interrupted you. Well, no, I, that's all I said was it, it. That's how people know San Marcos. It's oh, it's that town on the way to Austin. But what gonna, were you saying? I was going to say my boy Barlow. I didn't even think about that. Barlow's been through. Barlow's been sitting in the trenches on thirty five in San Marcos whenever the construction's going on. Oh my god! I know it's hit my boy at one point. <laughs> from, from exit one ninety five to two oh eight, it's just backed up. Oh my gosh! All righty. Um, what do we have here? Okay, Ethan. Well, the next thing we have on the docket is the draft odds. They are secured. They are final. The season is over and the Spurs have fell from three to five, Ethan. But it is not the worst thing in the world because we are still one of the only five teams in the NBA that has a 10% chance or excuse me, a double digit percent chance of the number one pick. Mm. So here we go. Here are the official odds now that the season is over. So as you can see, if you want to add up the percentages, the Spurs have gone from, well, you know, if you were number three, still the highest total percentage chance percentage chance would have been the six, sixth pick, but now there's a much higher chance of going six, seven, and eight. Than there would have been otherwise. But as you can see, Ethan, it's not drastically different from three really at all, other than 0.1%. Um, or excuse me, I'm I'm off. I was looking at Charlotte. My bad. <laughs> I was looking at the four numbers, even though we're five. So scratch everything I just said. Um from three, though, as you can see, now we have a like what? We have a 20% chance, 20 plus percent chance, basically at both the sixth and the seventh odds. And then you've got the 8% for eight as well. There's a chance you could even fall to nine, even though that's the least likely scenario. Um, But I could sit here forever and break it all down, Ethan. But the people who are watching on podcast, you see the odds that are up here. You see how it's changed from three to five. And for those of you guys listening on podcast, um, you'll just have to go to YouTube on this episode to check this one out. Dude, shout out the NBA for making it the most confusing method of draft <laughs> of draft odds I've ever seen. Like every year we talk about it and every year I get more lost. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's definitely but this is this is the odds table for the Spurs, but more importantly, as we've mentioned before, Toronto is at number 6. Now, here's this thing. You see the red highlighted odds there for Toronto? Yep, they have a high percent chance of dropping to 7. So that's the thing. Those four picks, as you see at the top of the page, positions resulting in a trade are highlighted in red. Not all trade swaps shown. This is just straight top six protected for Toronto. And as Spencer Galloway says in the comments right now, Toronto tanked so hard to keep that pick. And Mm. we'll see if they do, because there's still a chance. Um, And Ethan, I could really sit here and talk about all these odds, but let's just go ahead and run some tankathon sims let's to kind of give some examples to see how this plays out. And you know, the first one, we're gonna do a couple here just to give some examples. Um, but yeah, let's just go right into it. This is fun. So here you go. This is see, this isn't even necessarily a bad thing for the Spurs, but see, Toronto even moves up to three in this one, and we don't get their pick. Uh, for those of you guys listening on podcast, the Spurs just got the number two pick in this tankathon sim. This is not the be all end all whatsoever because in this pick or in this sim as well, Toronto moved up three spots and got the number three pick. Um, but that's just an example of how it's not 
all disastrous for the Spurs. And of course, in this one, Detroit still secured the number one pick. What's crazy about this specific scenario, Jude, is this might be one of the few opportunities where we would actually get Mr. Sar because Detroit has Jalen Duran, and that's I'm not saying they wouldn't take him just because he's I think regarded pretty much by most people as a number one pick. Um, but it's more difficult for them than it would be for us because of Jalen Duran's kind of one dimensional style of play. He is a center, a traditional center, a roll to the rim, dunk, block shot center, and he might be a little harder for them to pair with Sar. Um, than say for us to pay Sar with um, Wimbanyama. I, I see what you're saying there. I will say I think because I mean, unless I'm forgetting, like do, who's the starting four for for the Pistons? Should uh, I know that? Is that bad of me to not know that? I don't think so. It's probably like <laughs> Isaiah Stewart. That's uh, that that I, I know they play him at the four at times. Yeah, I do get what you're saying there because I think that from what I've seen of Sar's tape. I think there could be some clogging because of Duran's play style, but because of the fact that Sar is mobile and can stretch the floor, true, I could see them maybe in that position taking that. But they also maybe could take Stefan Castle. You know, um, Jaden Ivey's demeanor in that last game, man. I, I, I mean, you never know. Maybe they keep him. But that didn't, I mean, the whole team, but really him, like that's a game where you expect him to take over, you right. know, with, with with Cade Cunningham out. And we've heard rumors all year of how there's kind of been some, I mean, there's been a lot of bad stuff going on in Detroit's locker room, but there's specifically been talk of Jaden Ivey not meshing with the coaching staff as well. Mm. Um, but yeah, um, Stefan Castle could be an option there at guard if they elect to try to replace Ivy if they make a move with him. That's what I was trying to get to. But do you want to do another tankathon here, Ethan? Let's do it, please. Okay. See oh. here, this is this is a this, this isn't the worst scenario. Oh, we know it's not. Yeah. And and this is I'm glad we got this one. And for those of you guys listening on podcast, the Spurs just got the seventh pick, but Toronto's fell to eight. So they have back-to-back picks and keep Toronto's. This, if I had to, if you had to ask me, Ethan, I would prefer that we just get two picks. I would love to have a top five pick. I would prefer that if we could get a dream scenario where we get a top five pick and keep Toronto's pick, Mm -hmm. that would be incredible. But if this happens, Ethan, and we end up getting seven and eight, I don't want to sound crazy here, Ethan, but I think I'd rather have seven and eight, seven and eight than just four. I agree a thousand percent. And we or don't even have three. Least. One or two right. is a little different, but three or from three down, I'd be cool with having seven and eight over those, just because I'd rather take sh- two shots on people or have an asset, you know, to use in a trade. A thousand percent. I'm not saying this would happen, but getting seven and eight as opposed to like four has the possibility of drafting, say, a, a Topic and a Holland, or a Topic and a, uh, what's that, what's old boy's name that you like a lot? Matas, Matas Buzelis, is that his name? Mm-hmm, there you go, yeah. Like, being able to cover both the point guard and a wing would be kind of crazy to do in one draft. Yeah, um, I would I, I would love to just, I, I think for, like I said, the the fact that you can take a shot on two players in the top 10 mm-hmm. we see how that works out every year there's guys that are you know that fall there's guys that are picked even you know y'all get what i'm saying in right. the draft there's hits and misses so mm-hmm. having two picks is just i'd rather have two than one and then on top of that if we're going to decide to make a move potentially this could be something that would be very valuable just having two first round pick or two top 10 picks like, mm-hmm. which is what's going to happen if we get both, um, I think is invaluable for a numerous amount of reasons. Couldn't agree more, sir. But yeah, Ethan, I think I think that's a good way to kind of wrap up the tankathons there because that just showed one where, and there can be worse ones. There can be ones where where we get seven, um, and then there and and Toronto jumps up to three. So as much as those two were pretty solid. Um, that's not the be all end all, but still, I like the example of there's a chance we could go up to two and then not get the Toronto pick, or there's a chance we could go to seven and then even keep the Toronto pick at eight. But it just all depends on the lottery gods, Ethan. We were blessed 
last season. Um, and it's not always super common that it happens two years in a row. Mm, mm. I, I agree with everything that you've said thus far, Jude. All righty. Well, now, because we looked at that, Ethan, we're going to go ahead and look at a big board here real quick. Let me just get the link going. We're going to look at the Ringers NBA draft guide here. I got it up now. Sorry. Okay. And here is the big board from Kevin O'Connor. So I figure what we do, Ethan, is we just kind of go through the top 12, 15 players on this just to not like super in depth, but just go through them, kind of read a little bit of what Kevin O'Connor has to say. Um, and then just so we can kind of get an idea of the potential people that the Spurs may be drafting. Got it. Let's do it. All right. So we'll start with Stefan Castle, who Kevin O'Connor has as the number one player on his big board in the draft. Alexander Saar, as you can see down here, he's been at number one in a lot of other places uh, for most of the year. But after March Madness, Stefan Castle kind of took the reins here uh, on the Ringers big board, at least. You can see the shades of Markel Fultz, Anthony, Gla Anthony Black. He's described as a jumbo-sized guard who can do it all and could have superstar upside if his jumper improves. So is it that is it that a template for a lot of people on the Spurs roster? Um, uh, no, all jokes aside, just to read some of the stuff that they have here, he says, got that dog in him, hustle, on-ball defense, feel for the game, mm -hmm. um, and probably will be 20 by the time that the season starts next year at 6'6", 190. How much of Stefan Castle have you seen, Ethan? Literally nothing. <laughs> okay. Well, from what I've seen from him, um, Kevin O'Connor basically he he describes this pretty spot on. Um, the shooting is really the main thing, um, and that's why he gets the Markel Fultz and Anthony Black comparisons. With that being said, I think he is a very connective player. Um, and he's I mean, he's really basically good at everything else other than shooting. Um, and as much as that is something that the Spurs um, have been focusing on going into next year when it comes to improving it, that shooting, mm -hmm. if we were to get Stefan Castle anywhere in the top three, I would be completely fine with it. And I see some comments, people are not liking it, blah, blah, blah. But in comparison to some of the other guards this year, not to say that there aren't some other good ones, um, I think Stefan Castle would add another element of mm. just a dynamic potential all-star level player at the guard position that we need. And he, he's still good in the midi. Um, and, and I don't think that his shooting is completely um, unmendable, I guess is what I'm saying. Like, I think there's a world where he can become a solid three point shooter. Maybe I'm wrong, but um, mm. Yeah. To me, the thing we need to draft for most is defense, personally. I know we think shooting because of Wembanyama, but we are the worst defense in the league, um, especially when Wembanyama is not playing. Trey Jones, as much as I've loved him, as much as he has taken strides, is not the best defender. So for a Stefan Castle to come in and fix that situation, uh, that would be huge for us. And just individual players that can – that could defend and not have to rely so much on Wembenyama being behind him. Yeah, and and he can play make like him in the pick and roll with Wemby. He's going to be able to to do things. Um, I mean, I know that's that's not super descriptive, but a lot of it's just on the screen right now. I'll just read the first paragraph of his pluses: high field playmaker who controls tempo by playing at his own pace. He'll change rhythm and can decelerate with ease, showing excellent body control and footwork on drives with great size and strength. He can plow through defenders too. Makes the simple play with skip passes, kickoffs, and inferior, interior feeds. Think about those skills in a pick and roll with Wemby, Ethan. Do you get mm. what I'm saying? I do. Yeah. And and the last thing you mentioned is defense. That's the thing when I've watched him that stuck out the most to me. We know the Spurs love that. And he's he's won two straight national championships. He's a winner as well. Mm. Love that. But let's move on to Alexander Saar. 
shades of Jaron Jackson Jr., Jonathan Isaac. We, we talked about Jaron Jackson Jr. and, you know, kind of their comp. Obviously, he's taller, has a bigger wingspan uh, than Jaron Jackson, but we kind of talked about that in a recent episode. Um, and then Jonathan Isaac, I like that one too. Um, and that's why he noticed he says shades, you know, because obviously Jonathan Isaac and Jaron Jackson Jr. are very different players whenever it comes to like one being a, has Jaron Jackson gone to an all-star game yet? Yeah. That's what once, I, thought. I think. Yeah. Yeah. But not this year. Um, but still an all-star level four and then kind of a guy who's, who's more of a role player. Um, but still, they throw in Jonathan Isaac because he's a little bit bigger than Jaron Jackson Jr. It's kind of like Jaron Jackson Jr. with Jonathan Isaac's size. Not to just talk about them the whole time, even <laughs> with those being the only two comps up there. But regardless of that, um, his defensive potential, uh, the way that he can still stretch the floor, people can question shooting percentage, but I think it's kind of a similar case with Victor last year. Um, like, cause see, they say this year in Perth, he's shooting just 29.5% from three and 61% from the line, which is about what he averaged at overtime elite the year before too. Uh, he doesn't have much touch away from the basket either. So shooting efficiently from three may just not be in the cards from what I watched this year. And maybe I'll end up being wrong, Ethan. I just disagree with that. Um, I, I think he if you give him some open looks in the pick and pop, he's going to be a, a pretty solid shooter. Um, I know the numbers aren't that great, but neither were Victor's. Um, mm. I think when you watch the tape, he's definitely got a, a solid jump shot. Um, not to say that there's not room for improvement there, but I think that there's a reason why he put Jaron Jackson Jr. and Jonathan Isaac. Like both of those guys can still stretch the floor. Um but on top of that, his his defensive versatility at uh, they've the Perth lists him at seven one. This says six eleven. Regardless, he's around seven feet tall. Um, but he's also you know not the heaviest guy either. So he's someone who can play the four or the five. I see. Obviously, if the Spurs were to pick him, he's going to play more of the four. Um, but there's a lot of things in in his game that I think translate to the modern NBA. The only thing I'll disagree with you on is I think he might be a better uh, five than a four. Okay. And let Wemby operate as a stretch four. Kind of how we had him with Zach this year. And I think that Alexander Saar as a Jaron Jackson Jr. type center defender with Wemby roaming as a help defender is stronger than vice versa, if that makes sense. I get what you're saying. I think I disagree there. I, I and, and that's also because of what we've seen this year. And I know Zach Collins is very different. We talked about this in the last episode, too, where we played Zach next to Victor for a little bit, and it still just didn't, it mm-hmm. didn't look very good. And obviously, Zach is kind of a big asterisk there. But I think this season, we've kind of learned that we can get the most out of Victor when he's playing the five. Now, maybe you did use this example in our last conversation, talking about Bam Adebayo and Jaron Jackson and how maybe switchable guys and mobile guys like that would be able to make him playing the four more of a possibility. Um, so I, I I do see the train of thought there, mm. um, but I, I, I personally, just me, would see him more as a four on the Spurs. But... I could be proven wrong because he does have a lot of rim protection ability. Um, he, When you look at his tape on the Perth Wildcats, um, he's definitely dominating the paint. So it's not that I don't think he has that in his skill set. I just feel like Victor, what we've seen from him in that same kind of scenario, um, it's, it's just a higher upside. And that's just because he's Victor. Like Victor's going to have a higher upside than a lot of players in a lot of different categories. Completely understandable, um, which is why he's actually not one of my favorite guys to draft because I think it's – I honestly don't think it would fit that well with the mm-hmm. with the pair of them. Um, now, he would be a major upgrade if we wanted to play him at the backup center <laughs> instead of Zach Collins. But mm-hmm. if push came to shove, I would, I would venture toward other players. But, Jude, I'm going to have to go for two minutes because I now it. have to use the restroom. So excuse me for a moment. No, go do it. All righty, y'all. Well, with that, I'm going to go ahead and pause this and just look at some of the comments we have in here. Um, And we're going to go through the rest of that big board here in a second. I'll probably speed it up 
when Ethan gets back a little bit because we've already been on for an hour and a half and we still have some other stuff uh, that we want to get to because it's finally the off season. But let me go ahead and get to some of y'all's comments. So Brandon Vela says, Stefan Castle reminds me of Jimmy Butler coming out of college, to be honest. That's interesting because Jimmy Butler was a second round pick, but with their play style and, and the similarities there, I can totally see what you're saying. Um, and I don't think Marquette is in the same conference as UConn. Maybe it is. UConn, I think, is still in the Big East for basketball. Uh, I could be wrong there, but regardless, kind of you know, schools that aren't necessarily big name schools in other sports, but they're very good uh, in, in basketball, like UConn and, and Marquette. Let's see what Victor says here. Castle's potential is higher than Reed Shepard, Rob Dillingham, etc. Only other point guard I see with a higher ceiling than Stefan Castle is Nikola Topic. Interesting. Interesting. I definitely agree on the Reed Shepard point. Um, I like Rob Dillingham a lot. Um, I know there's some questions with his game, but I think bringing in a bucket getting point guard with the skills that he has and the off the dribble isolation ability off the bounce that, that he has, I think that would just add a different dynamic to our offense. Now, he does have some defensive questions, um, and we did see his play move, playmaking improve a little bit. Um, throughout, at least in, I say a little bit, it, the stats aren't going to jump at you, but throughout the season, you saw Rob Dillingham's playmaking get better. Um, but still he was, you know, mainly an off the dribble scorer. I like that first, just because we only really have Devin. And I think that the Spurs can hone the, um, what's the word Ethan, are you on here? Oh, yeah. Can you see me? There you go. Now I can see you. Uh, I was, just, <laughs> I was just talking about Rob Dillingham a little bit. Um, because this comment, he says, Victor says, Castle's potential is higher than Reed Shepard, Rob Dillingham, etc. And the only other person that he sees having a higher ceiling than Stefan Castle at guard is Nikola Topic. Mm. Um, and I was just kind of saying that I think, I definitely agree with him on Reed Shepard, but I think that there may be a chance that, that Rob Dillingham might um, have a similar or even higher, but really what I'm going for here is maybe a, just a similar potential um, mm. to... Stefan Castle. Honestly, Rob Dillingham and Stefan Castle are kind of like inverted prospects. Like not necessarily in size and stature, but in play style. Like Castle needs to get better at, well, the off the dribble scoring he has kind of off like in the mid-range and driving to the basket. Um, but still, just for the sake of this conversation, they're kind of inverted in the sense that Rob Dillingham is a solid shooter, can score off the dribble and 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 can score um kind of similar to Devin when it comes to like the, the step back jumpers and whatnot um, mm -hmm. and just needs to improve on his playmaking and his defense where castles already there, but needs to improve on his shooting. Um, but still I, I would agree that castle is the most proven guard in the class, which is why he's number one. But regardless of that, Ethan, do you want to get back to this big board? Let's do it. I do have to mention one thing before I forget. Go ahead. My, my boss, Mike Ingle says, hello. He wanted me to tell you that specifically. I know he commented, he but he's here in the comments. He says, can't believe I'm late. Well, first of all, hello, Michael. Thank you for saying hi. Um, and then he says, is the season season really over? Triathlon just started <laughs> or triathlon season just started. Well, there you go. The guys need to get in triathlons to, to get in their, uh, their conditioning. <laughs> right, Ethan? Right on. I couldn't agree more. <laughs> okay. I did tell the people while you were gone, Ethan, I'm going to try to speed this up just a okay. little bit because we do have some other stuff to get to. I'm, I'm um, hungies. Me, me too. I am. <laughs> I am too. I ain't gonna lie. And I've got some pizzas waiting for me. Ooh. But okay, so here's what we're gonna do. We're not gonna open up the other stuff. We're just gonna do the shades of mm. Donovan Klingon at number three. This was when you asked me about Edie. I said I felt like I would rather have him, but he's probably gonna be too high. It's kind of crazy that he's this high up for Kevin O'Connor. I probably need to watch more of him. Um, but to be honest, I know this says shades of Roy Hibbert. Go. I, here's what I think is going on here, Ethan. This is Walker Kessler, but people are realizing he's Walker Kessler, so they're going to pick mm -hmm. him higher. That's probably a really good point. That's like really he point. he might have some more, and I need to watch him more. So y'all can correct me in the comments. And as you can see, <laughs> interior interior scoring, right? 
I think he may have a little bit more of an offensive game than than Walker does. Um, but at the same time, that's kind of I think that's a very apt comparison. Seven foot two, two eighty, shot blocking, rebounding, off ball defense. And even when they say off ball defense, I don't think they're necessarily referring to his movement. I think they're just referring to him as a guy kind of like, you know, similar to Wemby, not to this extent, but guys will, you know, drive towards him and then maybe make a pass or decide to drive around him and extend the play. Right. Mm. I'll take that back up center. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't hate it either. Um, And I'm kind of going off my point here because I just said like, and I, th- I want to stick to that. Victor needs to play center, but we do need an upgrade at backup center. <laughs> and this would be really nice to have on a rookie contract. If we, if we get like Toronto's pick at seven, eight, and he's available and we take him, I'm not going to be mad at all. If he's exactly what, this is set, telling me that he is, but something tells me he won't be available at that point. Yeah, I don't think so either, but <laughs> I'm looking at this, Ethan, and I'm just like, man, this is exactly what we need off the bench at center. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> it's just all the things Zach like, struggles with. <laughs> Give me big Roy. <laughs> okay, Nikola Topic. I like this. Shades of Goran Dragic, not Nikola Jokic or Nikola Jokic but crafty shot creator who jitterbugs around the floor to generate bugs. He had a game also where I believe he scored 50 in Serbia. So I, I understand why Victor earlier said that he feels like Topic might potentially have a higher ceiling than Castle. I think it's just because he's playing in the Serbian league. That's, mm-hmm. that's really the only question mark with, with Topic IMO. I haven't gotten into his highlight reel, to be honest with you. I just know what other people are saying as like the next Luka Doncic because he's a foreign point guard with size. <laughs> okay. I, I From what I have seen, I haven't watched him in a while, but when I first heard of him, I went on a little bit of a, a research YouTube rabbit hole, if you will. Um, it, it Once again, I'm not trying to repeat myself, but it, it just really all depends on like whether it's going to translate from the Serbian League. Because if the stuff that he's doing translates from the Serbian League, um, it's going to be, it, he'll be a really, really good point guard. Like not, I don't think that he's going to be Luka, but I think that he could be, like there's a reason why he has him number four on the big board. And I think he could be, a top five talent in a draft if everything translates. Right. We'll see. <laughs> I mean, I, the Spurs are the, are the goats with, with foreign players. So except Lucas Hominich, except Lucas. Hominich. Well, he, he, he beat uh, the other night. I was going to say, maybe it's just Will Hardy. Anyways. Um, here's what I'll say. <laughs> We're going to get down to our boy, Reed Shepard here. And I know a lot of people like Reed Shepard and I don't want to crap on him too much, but like Topic is like way, be- <laughs> like, like uh, way better Reed Shepard. That's <laughs> like, I would better. I would out of I would I would so much rather take Nikola Topic than Reed Shepard. And I feel bad saying that about Reed Shepard because he's he would school me in basketball like in so many different ways, not just like on the floor, but probably some IQ stuff too. You know what I mean? He could probably come on and do this show better than I could if we're just being completely bluntly honest because of his basketball knowledge. I don't know that maybe he's not as as uh, entertaining. I could maybe go for that. Um, but <laughs> I just I think that that Nikola Topic, like I said, I, I would like him a lot more than Reed Shepard. But getting to Matas Buzelis, Ethan, he is someone who kind of coming into the year I thought was going to be a four, but as I watched him more. He's somebody who could definitely play the three. And if we did end up picking him, I think he's a plug and play guy where he takes Julian's spot. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. I, I, you said that about Matas Buzelis? Mm-hmm. Oh, absolutely. 1000%. And one of the comps I saw for him that's actually not the one that's up there is Franz Wagner. And I think that's actually a really apt comparison as well because similar size and I think brings pretty much everything to the game. Like, doesn't have really that many weaknesses, especially offensively, just kind of does everything that you need him to do. Um, how does How is he as a shooter, Jude? Is he knocking down consistently? Pretty solid. 
let's go ahead and look at his percentages. Yeah. Uh, final season of high school made 43%. He's black. He's back below 30% during the G league season, but okay. The, the ignite literally got canceled because of this season. Like if you, if you go watch him, you can, there are games in the G league this year where he's shooting very well from three and catches fire. Um, I just think that once Ron Holland got hurt, everyone just doubled him every game. And that's why Ignite was two and 19 and Adam Silver literally canceled it. So <laughs> I just, I'm not trying to make that like the complete excuse for his numbers being low, but the context of the situation matters. For sure. And I, that's something that he can probably get way better at too. Even if it is just slightly inconsistent. Um, Cause like I said, everything else that's, that's what he does. There's a reason he says connective playmaker with size shooting and the ability to play anywhere on the floor. Right. You're not going to be able to play anywhere on the floor if you're if you can't shoot. You know what I'm saying? A thousand percent. Yeah. So <laughs> y'all go look at Ignite's record. And then when Ron Holland, who was supposed to be the highest rated prospect on the team, is out for the year, they were yeah. just double teaming Buzelis. Like I watched even against the Austin Spurs. They're just double teaming him every game. And then it's like, what is he supposed to do? Anyways, yeah. I feel I feel bad for him in that situation. The fact he played out this year, um, good for him. But then we've got Dalton Necht at number six. I'm glad he's above Reed Shepard too. And this is not to make this, like, because look at Reed Shepard. He's shades of Derek White. Like, I should love him. He, he really does fit all the Spurs qualities. I'm just not sure if athletically he's going to translate. Like, I'm not sure if he's going to be able to do the stuff that he did in college when there's five other NBA players on the floor. I just, that's my biggest question with Reed Shepard, but I get why he's a top seven player. Dalton Necht, on the other hand, because of his size, and yes, he's he's an older player. There's a reason, though, that at his age, he's a top 10 player um, on this on this big board. And I know you may see KCP, Max Struess. How is he number six? He he's he's gonna. I mean, he's gonna come in as a twenty three year old, and he's just gonna he's gonna already be developed. Movement shooter, pull up threat, clutch gene, off ball defense, on ball defense. Um, I would not be mad. The, he's somebody I think could also be a plug and play for Julian as well. And even though he, you probably see him as a little bit more of a two at six six, he can still play the three. Um, I would not mind taking him at all, even though he's a little bit older uh, whenever it comes to the timeline. There are types of players that I will spend an arm and a leg on, and if he's anything remotely similar to Contavious Caldwell Pope, I'll he has take a higher him with, ceiling. I'll take him with the number one overall pick. I <laughs> love Contavious Caldwell Pope. So you've sold him on Ethan Quintero, that's for sure. I love that, Ethan. But but Dalton Necht, like all the appeal that people talk about with Reed Shepard, I think he has the same, but it's going to translate better. That's just my personal opinion. Maybe I'll be proven wrong. We'll see. Mm. Look, I personally don't like, especially in this era, small guards, especially if they're not going to be super hyper athletic. So if that's what he is, then I'm I'm exactly. not a fan of that pick either. Unless w- with our odds, I'm knocking on wood because with our luck, Jude, he's going to be the next John Stockton and get three thousand <laughs> career assists or whatever it is, and we're just going to be like, oh man, oh my gosh. You know who I do like from Kentucky? Who's a guard, Ethan? Rob Dillingham. Very much so. I I have him above Reed Shepard personally, and I might even have him a little bit higher up in this big board. But I will say Kevin O'Connell, or excuse me, Kevin O'Connor knows more than I do and has been doing this way longer. I think he has a higher potential than Lou Williams or Bones Highland. With that being said, he does have shades of both of them in their game. Off the dribble score, ball handling, you see the float games up there. The Mm -hmm. things that he needs to improve on, first of all, we saw flashes of his playmaking improve this year and then defensively. Um, But I don't necessarily think that he's like a potato defensively because here we go. Active but erratic defender. I think that's a great way to describe it. Too often falls out of position by getting handsy, lost, or simply not understanding what his opponent is doing. His fundamentals need to dramatically improve because there's no way to solve his lack of size. Um, with that being said, I think the fundamentals that does tie a little bit in to overtime elite, 
Um, if you've watched any of those games, <laughs> you know that that is very much a... Uh, I don't want to take away from it because they've been sending guys to the NBA and now they're going to be the main p- person to do that with mm-hmm. um with with G League Ignite going and they're still surviving for a reason and getting prospects mm-hmm. to come play for them for a reason. But it is a very highlight driven league owned by a highlight company in overtime. Um, so I can see why the fundamentals aren't there, but notice how he says active and it's it's him getting handsy. So it's not because he's not trying. It's just because he's trying to do too much and then getting lost. Like all the minuses that I'm reading there, I'm like, okay, this is send him to pop defense camp mm. and that'll improve over a season. You know what I mean? Yeah, the defense doesn't scare me. The only thing that scares me is his size, Jude. But mm-hmm. honestly, I, I'm a guy that likes the Trey Young thing too. So I can't even say that without being hypocritical. So if, if he's everything that you're saying he is, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with you as always. Maybe it's just my bias that I have for the overtime elite players, Ethan. Um, but it's more his off the dribble scoring. His he is an electric bucket getter who is starting to develop to develop as a playmaker. I'm not even like that. That sentence lines up with all the tape I've watched on him. And if defense is the other thing he needs to get better at, I think this is like when we look at the guards on our team, we can teach them all playmaking and defense. You know what I mean? But if he comes in as another bucket getter, you know what I mean? Next to Devin, that's going to take the load off Devin a little bit. It's going to take the scoring load off of other guys who are potentially having bad nights and him in the pick and roll or the pick and pop just in the two man game with Wemby. I I don't want to be redundant next to Devin, but I think that that would give us a lot of help offensively and whatever defensive deficiencies he has. I think that other moves that we potentially make this off season and other guys taking jumps, um, I think we'll, we'll nullify that eventually. Hmm. Only thing I'll say, and this is, this will be pretty much the last thing I say probably is that defense is still my number one priority. So if push came to shove, I'd probably take somebody that's higher or is better of a defender if they're available. Totally get what you're saying. Okay, we're going to stop after 9 and 10 here. But here are Cody Williams, who is J-Dub's little brother, um, and Zachary Rissache, shades of Michael Porter Jr. from the LNB Pro A in France. Connective piece on offense who could quickly learn a role as a two with his two-way versatility. He is a sniper. Um, and then Cody Williams, dynamic finisher and a big, big playmaker with an impressive defensive toolkit. Um, I think both of these guys, well, they, they play the same position first off. So that's kind of why I paired them together. Um, they're different. I would say that Zachary is more of a bona fide shooter. Where I still in the Colorado games that I watched, I saw Cody Williams take some pull up jumpers and take some wide open catch and shoots. I'm not exactly sure what his percentage is. Um, though he's never really shot well from three, there's hope for him. He shot about 80% from the line EYBL. That's the, the big Nike league, 77%, um, as a senior in high school, his older brother was also a late bloomer as a three point shooter too. So there is, um, some help there, but I have watched him like hit multiple threes in a game at Colorado. I believe it was actually against USC when he was playing Collier, um, I watched that game. So while that's still a question mark for him, where it's not at all a question mark for Zachary, um, there's a lot. I mean, look, look at the way that J-Dubs looked and look at how he's kind of improved. I don't mm-hmm. want to say that that's a guarantee that Cody Williams is going to have the same thing, but I see a lot of th- there's a reason they say shades of Jalen Rose. Um, and, and I think there's a lot of I think he has a lot of upside. That's what I'm trying to get to. I wouldn't mind it, um, especially if you think he can play the three spot and eventually, maybe not immediately, but eventually take that starting spot as a potential three and D guy. And if his upside is where his brother is, then absolutely 100% pull the trigger. Yeah. The, and the more I'm looking at this, Ethan, even though he has Rasasher at number 10, dude. You put him in nine? Dude, we we not even that. I'm just realizing he fits our team really well. Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. like if Zachary Rasatcher, if we could just put him at the three, and Wemby's talked about how much he likes him as well, that would, 
he's like Julian with like a 10 times higher ceiling and he's coming in as an automatic sniper too. Yeah. Uh, he, yeah. He's immediately just an upgrade over Julian. As much as I love Julian, as right. much as he made strides th- at the end of the year, uh, at 19 years old to be six, eight, immediately a three point threat with all the toolkit to improve in every other facet of his game. Like I'm with this pick for sure. All righty. Well, that will wrap up a little bit of our big board here. We could have gone longer or or gone down the big board, but I think we were kind of, um, what's the word we've already been going for a while and, um, we just needed to wrap that part up. What I will do is scroll through this mock draft in this unfortunate lottery that Kevin O'Connor did, the Raptors got the number one pick. So that sucks for us. Um, but, and, and we ended up getting the sixth pick in this draft and we actually picked Donovan Klingon. So you, you mentioned that scenario earlier, Ethan, and, mm-hmm. and here it is playing right out. I wouldn't be mad at it at all, but I just wanted to show this before we moved off of it. Just to give an example. I'm a prophet. <laughs> 100% Ethan. Now, believe it or not, We still have some stuff on the docket here. We're going to try to wrap this up just because we are at uh, uh, an hour and 30 here almost. This might be, well, no, we did did sit through a game one time. I don't know if you remember that. I do. I do remember that. (laughs) And we realized we don't want to do it ever again. Um, (laughs) Even though it was fun, it still, it it just wasn't uh, the greatest thing of all time for us. But what we are going to do is we're going to look through this off-season draft guide for the Spurs to kind of set the stage for everything moving forward, and then we'll wrap this up. Does that sound good, Ethan? Sounds great. All righty. So this is Bobby Mark's off-season preview for the San Antonio Spurs. So here are our draft picks in June. Uh, Number five, that's just where they're setting it right now, potentially Toronto. Uh, We also own the number 35 pick, which is our own. And then we have another second round pick from the Lakers late in the draft. Um, And then our free agents, Shetty Osman is the only unrestricted free agent on the roster. Mamu, Dominic Barlow, and David Duke Jr. are all potentially free agents, but they're restricted free agents, which means we can match any offer. So literally the only person that that's that's kind of interesting too as we get into this off season because the other thing that I wanted to talk about at some point Ethan is just the prospects of us potentially making a move that isn't a normal Spurs move if you will when it comes to trading for a big player moving some of our assets to improve the roster around Victor um but we're going to have to move some of the guys because like I said Literally just one person that is an unrestricted free agent. But let me read this so we can talk through it. State of the roster. Victor Wembanyama put together one of the best rookie seasons in NBA history, but despite the emergence of a top 15 player, the Spurs finished tied for the third fewest wins in a season in franchise history. The youngest roster in the NBA, nine players under 23, ranked ninth in the fewest number of games missed due to injury and used only 22 different starting lineups this season. For comparison, the Memphis Grizzlies used 51 different starting lineups this season. The inexperience played a role in San Antonio's 13-28 record in clutch games. The the Spurs have 12 players under contract next season, and the clock to improve the roster started the night when Benyama was drafted, not when the season ended on April 14th. It's funny he writes this and then Wemby does that interview (laughs) in the post-game press conference being like, I never wavered because that's what he's trying to hint at. Um, But, you know. They're going to do their thing, the media people. Uh, when Wembenyama was off the court, San Antonio allowed 117 points per 100 possessions compared to 111 when he was on the court. The Spurs were 3-8 and eight in the games he did not play. And here is the quote that I somehow missed at some point this season, Ethan, but I think it's very telling. I don't pretend to know what we're going to do, Coach Greg Popovich said in March. We have a lot of possibilities ahead of us whether it's having money in the bank or draft picks or being creative trade-wise. All of those things are on the table. And here's where he does some coach coach speak and tries to downplay it, but kind of ignore this a little bit. All the, uh, but aren't they for every team? I know, I don't know why we're any different. We're just younger. Here's where I do agree with Bobby Marks. But the Spurs are not like every other team. They have a 20-year-old franchise player and nine tradable firsts in the next seven years. We're going to use those at some point. 
what are your thoughts on that um that statement from pop there ethan it's very on brand for coach pop to kind of be lackadaisical with what he says and not really make a decision one way or the other. <laughs> it's fully what I expected from him and really from everybody on the front office. Yeah. But I think also him saying like, Hey, we could be creative trade wise. We could, you know, use our draft picks and we do have money in the bank. Like he's alluding to those things, which he hasn't done over at least the past two seasons, really. So that is something that stuck out to me. Um, True. Go ahead. I was going to say true, but we also didn't have Wemby at the time. <laughs> so, very, 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 <laughs> absolutely right there. Um, offseason finances. San Antonio is not like fellow rebuilding team D- Detroit when it comes to cap space. No player on the roster er- earns more than $30 million, but because of their high lottery picks, San Antonio has less than $25 million in room. Unless the Spurs are going to clear out significant salary, that's why I mentioned Shetty being the only unrestricted free agent, because that ties into salary as well. Um, San Antonio, excuse me, unless the Spurs are going to clear out significant salary, do not expect them to be a major player in free agency. If the Spurs have only their own first, the maximum room they can create is $24 That means if we don't get the Toronto pick, Mm -hmm. which would mean waiving Devontae Graham and Charles Bassey. Graham's 12.7 million contract becomes fully guaranteed on July 1st. There is a 2.5 or 2.85 million uh, protected. So that means like there would still have to be, we'd still have to pay um, Devante that. And then Bassey becomes fully guaranteed on August 1st, but we're not going to save that much money from him either because it's only 2.5 million in the first place. Um, and the Spurs would have the 8 million room exception if they are a cap space team to sign somebody, if they operate above the cap, they will have the 12.9 million non-taxpayer mid-level exception and a 4.7 million biannual exception. Um, So that is just the state of the Spurs cap. I think my takeaway from that, Ethan, is if we're going to acquire more talent, it's probably going to be through a trade rather than free agency. As much as there's still some money to make some moves here and there to get some role guys if we wanted to, what I really took from that is if there's some move the Spurs make this season, it'll be through a transaction, not through free agency. Which I'm completely fine with, honestly. I think if we run it back with pretty much the same team, add a couple firsts, and then maybe make a move at the deadline, I'd be more than happy with that outcome. Yeah. And, and the other thing that, that you could see happen with this too is maybe you even move some players to sign a certain guy in free agency. Because right. a lot of the guys that we're moving are so young that you maybe could move them for picks if you wanted to, if there's somebody in free agency you like. So that is the state of the cap. Um, top front office priority. There are multiple questions in the front office. The front office should ask this off season. The first, okay, actually, before I start this, There's something I've been wanting to talk about all stream that I haven't got to, Ethan. And I think it ties more into what we just talked about with potentially making moves. Sean Elliott on the Detroit broadcast in the end of the season, he said, at the end of the broadcast, these both of these teams are probably going to look very different than last year. I know we're not going to look the same uh, next year, or I know we're going to make a lot of changes this year. And that's kind of where he left it. Mm. Um, And I tweeted about it today when I promoted the show about Sean Elliott's alluring comments. That's basically that when he said that the Spurs have fooled us a million times. It wouldn't surprise me if the Spurs kept everybody like you just said and went into next season with basically the same roster and maybe some moves here and there that are minor. But Mm. when he said that and with how good Victor is already, we've talked about this before. I think the Spurs are going to try to go do something. And that ties into that. You see Trey Young and Darius Garland um, that we're we're about to get into the top front office priority part here. For those of y'all listening on podcast, Bobby Mark suggests those as potential targets that we could go for. I don't even know if it's necessarily going to be them, Ethan, but I think we're going to use our assets to try to add some more talent around Victor this off season. And maybe it's not as big as one of those two guys, but with Sean saying that, I, I and maybe I'm falling for it here, but I just think 
when he said that, that really made me feel that way. Hmm. Well, you never know. Uh, I'm going to say Pat on my prediction, okay. which is nothing happens. <laughs> okay. Okay. And, and we've, we've seen it happen before, but I will say, I will say, I will stay Pat and say I'm on the other side of that because of Sean's comments, but only time will tell Ethan, but let me <laughs> almost go ahead. Sean also said Lonnie Walker was going to be an all-star level player. <laughs> there you go. But that's, that's a great point. That's a great point. <laughs> I just know he hears more than we do from those guys. So maybe we'll be, maybe he'll be wrong like he was about Lonnie. We'll just have to see. Um, top front office priority, though. There are multiple questions the front office should ask this offseason. The first is what did this season teach us with Victor Wembanyama on the roster? San Antonio ranked in the top 10 of points allowed per 100. Oh, I already read this. My bad. Um, or no, I didn't. My bad. Uh, top 10 points allowed per 100 possessions with Wembenyama at center. Uh, offensively, the Spurs struggled shooting the ball with Wembenyama at power forward and at center, shooting 34.7% on threes. Uh, the Spurs ranked 28th in three-point percentage and were 5-20 and 20 when they attempted at least 43 pointers. Going back to Zachary Rissacher, that's another appeal of him. The second is which players on the current roster or in a trade complement him best. The lineup of Wembenyama with Trey Jones, Devin Vassell, Jeremy Sohan, and Keldon Johnson averaged 127.3 points per 100 possessions per cleaning the glass. Third, should San Antonio skip steps in the rebuild, Ethan says they won't, and chase an all-star type player like Trey Young or perhaps Darius Garland if either becomes available. That would represent, and, and here's to Ethan's point, that would represent a shift in philosophy in how San Antonio has constructed its roster dating back to Tim Duncan. The difference now, though, is that San Antonio doesn't already have another David Robinson to pair with Wimbanyama. And finally, is taking a conservative approach a better strategy knowing that the 2025 draft is stronger than the 2024 one? That's another key point as well. Uh, that would require buy-in from Wembenyama to be willing to spend another season at the bottom of the standings. But here's the other thing, Ethan, with all that being said and all those points being very valid, if the guys keep making jumps, now they know how to play with Victor. Victor takes a jump. Maybe what we thought would happen last season could happen next year with the chemistry being better. Mm -hmm. There's so many things that, that, that go into this, but what are your thoughts on all those questions? I still want to stay pat on the conservative approach that we've been on. Um, I think the point that you just made is extremely valid that with the chemistry that we've built this season, as well as this off season, including potentially one or two first round picks being brought in this off season, um, that we, we might be, what's the word I'm looking for? escalated in the timeline without making a move, if that makes sense. And based on what Wemby said right. in his conferences to close out the year, I think that that's more likely to be accepted by him than I thought of recently. Because it's not going to be an open tank like it was really this year or the year before. It's just a, we might not be contending, but I think we'll definitely be better next year. It's just a matter of, you know, just taking the t taking steps in the process for sure i think that is put beautifully there ethan but we are finally going to wrap up with these final three paragraphs i'm just going to read all of them i'm going to dish it to you ethan and then we're going to wrap this thing up thank you guys for hanging out with us through all of this today we've had about 30 people in here for the majority of this almost an hour and 40 minute stream i didn't even necessarily want it to go this long but now that the season's over there's so much more to talk about Extension candidate to watch. The Spurs ended, uh, extended Devin Vassell and Zach Collins this past year. This offseason, there is no eligible player on a rookie scale contract. The only two extension eligible players are Osman through June 30th. That's probably not going to happen. And then Devontae Graham, who could be a roster casualty if the Spurs are looking to create cap space. So basically, nobody's on extension watch. Team needs. Stability at point guard and perimeter shooting off the bench. The Spurs started Sohan at point guard before switching back to Jones. The Spurs were scored at, were outscored by basically 20 points per 100 possessions when Sohan was starting at point guard, and the Spurs ranked 20th in three-point percentage among reserves. 
what are your thoughts on that, Ethan? I'm sorry, I didn't hear any of it. I was zoned out. <laughs> I'm so tired, dude. You're good. You're good. You're good. Stability at point guard and then perimeter shooting off the bench. Yeah. um, Perimeter shooting off the bench, I think, is actually not a huge need. Do you you see what I just read? The Spurs ranked 20th in three-point percentage among reserves. Really? Yes. Yeah. I think that kind of ties into Malachi a little bit. Um, And and you got to remember, we didn't start Champagne for like the at the beginning of the year champagne wasn't starting he was off the bench too so i, I get where you're coming from mm. i mean the the point guard thing is uh, for sure um i i would say point guard and wing sorry i'm i'm, I'm so tired no you're good you don't you don't have to apologize and also <laughs> what was i going to say is that that just i mean that still is the same thing like a point guard and a wing you're going to need shooting from both of those two positions so so that goes into both but we'll wrap up with future draft assets here. The Spurs rank behind only Oklahoma City. They are tied with Utah in first round picks over the next seven years. So that's pretty crazy. Those other than OKC, we have the most, it, well, we have the same as Utah, but still, I think there's a pretty solid gap even after uh, us in Utah when it comes to first round picks. So that's pretty crazy. Lots of, of first round picks over the next couple years. Um, San Antonio is owed unprotected first round picks from Atlanta in 2025 and 2027. So guaranteed two first round picks next season. The Spurs can also swap, swap with the Hawks in 2026. I could read all the rest of this, but the point is, is the Spurs have a ton of picks that eventually they may have, they're going to have to move. Um, but I liked what you just said earlier that yes, maybe there is a potential of them doing that this off season and using some of them but there's also a potential that that could be used at the deadline next year or maybe even uh, the the offseason, not this offseason, but the 2025 offseason as well. 100%. That's where I think we'll we'll be. There you go, guys. Well, we are going to finally wrap this up. Sorry for keeping you on here so long, Ethan. Um, (laughs) I don't, I know you're, I know you're happy to be here, but I realized that I was just, I wasn't trying to uh, tire you out too much, but um, my brain is even kind of a little bit fried at this point as well. We appreciate you guys hanging out with us. I know there are a bunch of comments that we didn't necessarily get to, but We appreciate all of y'all for the interaction. And if you want to stay updated with the channel, be sure to follow us on Twitter or X, whatever you want to call it, at SSPNLYT, at Jude McLaren, and at Ethan underscore Quintero. Don't forget to hit the like and the subscribe button below if you enjoyed the content and if you want to support the show. And I don't know how much longer this merch is going to be here, Ethan. You you never know with the new designs, when they could pop up, when yeah. they could be released. So if you want to get some Hemisphere merch, go over to sspn.myspreadshop.com. The link is in the description and on our YouTube. Y'all can check all that out. We appreciate y'all. We'll catch y'all in the next one. Go Spurs, go. <laughs>